What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Organic Guy podcast. I am your host, the Organic Guy. This is your home of organic conversations, where you get to hear from various thought leaders across the organic movement. Today, I'm super excited to be joined by Mr. Hannes, who is um, a professional with over 10 years' experience uh, working in organic agriculture, region ready food systems, short food supply chains, and um, social entrepreneurship. Um, he has worked in Latin America, especially in Peru, where he spent five years training farmers. Um, he worked in Europe with um, La Roche de Lou, which is uh, Europe's largest um, direct food sales network, uh, whereby in 2020 they did um, uh, gross sales over 14 million euros. Um, uh, Hannes is currently in uh, East Africa, uh, in Uganda, where he's um, started a CSA agroecology farm. Uh, he's also a mentor to eight uh, agroecology entrepreneurs, and um, he has started a very uh, exciting and award-winning project uh, called the Regenerative Fellowship, uh, which we'll talk uh, more about in a few minutes. Uh, but first, thank you very much for joining me in the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy happy to be here. So it's very clear f- uh, to me from your past, I mean, you are very much entrenched in um, the areas of sustainable food systems and the areas of short food supply chains. But to give us a little bit of context, has this always been the case? I mean, I'm trying to go back to your early childhood here and try to see why your parents talking more about sustainable food systems or sustainability in general while your neighbors talking about it or were you that children who was quite curious on things sustainable how was your background and how did you end up uh, in this particular space yeah so the the brother of my grandmother used to be the last uh, farmer in our in our family and and i remember uh, going to to harvest uh, with all the family and and playing and and working a bit at his farm but but i'm a very urban kid actually yeah. right uh, yeah. so when i was um seven my father took me, uh, he was working with an NGO, and he took us to Bolivia, and, and I vividly remember the slaughtering of a sheep yeah. um, to thank Mother Earth for uh, the, the water uh, she was giving in a, a newly digged well in, in collaboration with a, a local farmer organization. So I guess that aroused interest for me in, in working with water and, and agriculture, and, and, and then moving to Peru uh, as an adult, um, that turned into yeah my passion for organic agriculture, agroecology as a, as a motor for, for rural uh, development. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's very interesting. You mentioned a little bit about that. And also I noticed on uh, your background also you started business. So I'm also curious, how, how did you see that transition in terms of, I mean, you have a background in business and you're going into um, sustainability world where most of the times, you know, NGOs are involved, uh, governments are now very much involved and they're offering very good incentives for private businesses as well to come in. Um, how do you see that? How do you find that experience? Was it um, an easy transition for you to go into this space or, you know, there were some things that you needed to re- to relearn per se in order to yeah go into the sustainability world. It felt quite natural for me. I'm I'm a trained uh, economist, yeah. manager, uh, macroeconomist, let's say. Uh, but but yeah, solidarity, inclusiveness, and 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 fairness have been really uh, given to me by my parents uh, from from a young age. So I yeah I thank them for that. And and then when coming in the in the real world after university, I. I I found quite some differences between what I had learned and, and how uh, how the economy actually works. Um, so um, what, what I came to see as, as a really a root cause of, of a lot of the challenges we're facing as a society is, is economic inequality, right? Yeah, yeah. The Oxfam report stating that 1% of the world now owns more than all of the rest of us combined. That's uh, economic inequality right there. And I think that's really, um, yeah, very... Uh, elementary to, to the problems we're facing. Um, together with that, uh, especially here on the African continent, we, we can talk about the job creation deficit, right? Uh, there's about 1 million new youth coming into the job market every month, and we're only creating 3 million jobs a year uh, in Africa, which means there's a 9 million job uh, creation deficit. No, that, that's huge, and, and, that, and I really see that materializing here with, with, with friends I meet uh, in Uganda, and, and, and Despite having university degrees, they, they can't access any uh, relevant job and, and start building their own careers. Yeah. So um, 
after university, I guess I was really literally dropped in in Peru. Um, so so I appreciate I appreciated that opportunity to to start uh, relearning, as you said, or, or, or developing my economic uh, perspective from from a smallholder uh, farmer point of view. And 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 yeah, I've, I've been thinking a lot and, and and learning a lot about sustainable economic development and and how also to sustainably develop. E economic uh, initiatives yeah. uh, and and then the importance of course of fair prices and livelihoods for for smallholder farmers you mentioned uh, a little bit there that you know you you were literally dropped in peru where you worked for about five years trying to um, train farmers for example building direct food systems pgs advocacy um, so how was that experience i mean did you see any difference between their food systems and European food system? I mean, um, you spend majority of your, your time in Europe and then going into that territory of um, Peru and trying to understand their food system. Did you, first of all, did you see a difference in their food systems? And what, what do you think is the difference, if you saw any difference between their food systems and from the European perspective? Yeah, personally, I guess I needed to learn and adapt on how people relate and work together in that culturally different context, but there were no unusual uh, shocks or difficulties there. Um, what I really appreciated in Peru is it's an amazing country with an amazing natural environment and, and biodiversity. Uh, Peru is one of the most uh, biodiverse countries in the world, yeah. and, and, and you can really see that on your plate. You know? So the, I was there in the midst of the, of the gastronomic boom, uh, which was also helping us uh, as the organic movement to connect to that popularity of, of local gastronomy and, and, and also using it as a platform to promote biodiversity and, and smallholder uh, uh, agriculture, no? which is mostly conservationist of, of nature, right? Yeah. Um, so that was really um, a really great opportunity, I would say. Uh, the second thing I, I really appreciated about Peru uh, is, is the Andean cosmovision you know, of how everything uh, is, is, is related uh, in, in our natural environment, how uh, after farming or before farming, uh, the, the Apus, the gods that are represented in the local mountain peaks are, are thanked and appreciated. So yeah, this might sound a bit fluffy, but we are all connected. Two things that really surprised me, uh, I already mentioned biodiversity, but we, yeah. were, we were working with a farmer in, in Cusco uh, region uh, called Julio Hanco or also the Potato King. Uh, there's a movie about him even. He he was cultivating three to four hundred uh, varieties of native potatoes in his in his fields, right? And so that's an amazing uh, biodiversity uh, being cultivated and maintained throughout uh, generations. So yeah. it was really a surprising fact for me. And then maybe less positive, I was also uh, fascinated by the the, the the rapid loss of local uh, culture, tradition, languages, and also the, the disintegration of, of community life, no? which I guess is also something we, we can see happening here in, in East Africa yeah. at the moment. And, and yeah, it's, it's, we're, we've been way past that uh, in, in Europe, I would say. You have a very exciting project, as I mentioned earlier, that is already award-winning. I mean, I'm talking about the Regeneration Fellowship already. So can you give us an idea how how did this vision come about and what what is what is this vision that you have for this project yeah so i, I basically came to uganda uh, together with my wife and and looking for uh, things to, to to work on and had a lot of ideas and started mapping them and then i realized it's, it's probably not me who needs to build uh, local food solutions here uh, uh, and make sure they are adapted to the context and and i wanted to to support creating that uh, that environment where, where where local entrepreneurs can really turn their ideas into into viable businesses no so um what i want to do with um the regeneration fellowship is to build a, a startup studio approach to creating, founding and funding uh, the food companies uh, of tomorrow um, based on, on three important elements. Yeah. Um, first of all, regenerative agriculture, so a sustainable, nature positive, uh, agroecological uh, approach to agriculture and, and, and our food system uh, and, and strengthening that uh, organic agroecological food system from within by building new business leaders, uh, supporting them, let's say, to, to grow, and, and, and then also uh, by doing so, creating a demand for, for uh, organic uh, produce and, and as such, 
an incentive for farmers to produce sustainably and to move forward in their transition to, to agroecology. The, the second uh, principle is, is the one of uh, social entrepreneurship, which I came to appreciate a lot also with my experience in, in Europe uh, as a way to align for profit uh, uh, business, self-reliant uh, in its growth and uh, growing its impact most of all, and, and combining that with impact measures and uh, impact goals uh, really on, a, on an equal basis, right? Yeah. Um, the, the profits are also only a, a, a means to an end and, and not an end in itself. And then the final component is, is steward ownership, which is a way of changing the way our food companies uh, are managed, financed and uh, Owned. No, steward ownership is a, a relative new concept. Uh, also, to me, I just found out about it beginning of this year. Um, to to avoid mission drift in in purpose driven companies, it's also being promoted by the Purpose Foundation. And um, basically, what what it does is to um, ingrain the mission of a company into its legal DNA by separating voting rights, decision rights, and giving those to the stakeholders or the stewards of that company's mission uh, from um, the financial uh, dividend shares or rights uh, that, that can be returned to investors who can still get a fair return on their uh, investment, of course, but those exits are are more defined and, and in that way we are moving away from venture capitalism kind of uh, hockey stick seeking uh, or uh, unicorn uh, hunting kind of uh, growth and, yeah. and investments yeah. Um, and yeah I'm really excited about that because it's a way to make sure that stakeholder uh, long-term uh, value will always be more imp more important than short-term uh, financial profits um, and and as you said we got awarded for for this innovative combination between um, uh, regenerative agriculture, steward ownership, and social entrepreneurship. And, and the idea uh, of, of the, the project um, is to build, um, to develop a startup studio approach, which basically uh, consists of first selecting uh, talents who want to be yeah, game changers in the food system with entrepreneurial backgrounds, corporate backgrounds, or just young, passionate, uh, driven people uh, with uh, the, their mission uh, where their heart is. Um, the second step is then to take all of them together and, and conduct the food system analysis to really identify the, the pivotal or the key cornerstone problems of that system and then uh, start building solutions around those key uh, challenges. Um, and only after having identified and, and building and testing those solutions, only then starting to uh, develop teams uh, or, or build teams around those solutions to assure there is a best possible fit between talent and the solution and also between the solution and the context. Um, and then of course, prepare those ventures to uh, start uh, looking for finance and, and, and officially launch. That would be the program uh, in about uh, four to six months. We, we, we want to go through the first stages of that program. And uh, the aim is to pilot next year uh, here in Uganda uh, to validate also all the hypotheses we have behind this approach and, and see how this model will work in uh, here in East Africa. Um, and I'm looking uh, at the moment at, at financial and technical part partners to do so. I already have a first uh, potential uh, investor uh, or founder, uh, but uh, definitely need uh, two or uh, one or two more. It's, it's a very inspirational story. And um, when I look at it, especially the last part of steward ownership, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it's quite a, a new concept, but I, I, I sort of like it because we've seen scenarios before where companies start with a good heart and they have very great missions, but uh, later on, we they get um, different investors, and at the end of the day, investors want quick returns in their and their money. And missions always change over that over time as those funds come in. So, for example, um, in Kenya, we had Twiga Foods, which was one, which held one of the best companies uh, in East Africa in terms of helping farmers and uh, helping them find market. Um, yeah, reducing the distance between them and different vendors. But we can see when they got different investments, they sort of abandoned that vision as time goes on. So it's a very interesting perspective on how can we ingrain these missions into the company itself. And for me, it looks very, very, um, um, yeah, outbreaking. And I can't wait to see how it actually works out uh, in the real world. So uh, definitely um, yeah. a great and looking forward to see how it goes ahead as well. 
Yeah, I visited uh, East African fruits in Tanzania, which is very uh, similar to, to Twiga foods, yeah. uh, I believe. And, and of course, there is always a, a gap between the initial ideals of, of the founders yeah. and the practical reality of implementing such a business and, and keeping it afloat. So we also need to recognize that. But but I think uh, what you said is real. Eh? Mission drift uh, is, a, is a strong risk, especially in, in VC type of uh, financing. So um, as, yeah, to me, steward ownership is the, the perfect approach to to just avoiding uh, that issue yeah and one thing also that keeps me positive that this is definitely going to be a success is your uh, historical background because you are heavily involved um, here in Europe with um, LaRouche Kidiwi which you are very much part of it you are at the heart of it especially establishing it um, um, in Belgium and also in the Netherlands and very critical of it in 2020 when they did um, about 14 million euros so can you give us an idea from your experience being involved in that particular project um, how do you see do you think that um, the consumer was ready for such a kind of a project or do you think that just by your sheer determination and sheer marketing of that product is what made it to be as successful in the end. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, La, La Ruche or the food assembly in English is, is a great example of a of a social uh, startup and, and its timing of, of, of launching uh, 2011 in France and uh, later in, in different countries uh, across Europe uh, was very, very uh, um, right uh, on spot. No? So that, that helped a lot in, in, in the booming of, of that network and, and the fast growth. Uh, I got involved uh, right after coming back from Peru uh, in 2015 and, and then launched uh, our business, as you said, in, in the Dutch part of Belgium and also the Netherlands afterwards to then manage the, the network in, in those countries and, and, and develop, keep on developing, developing that business with the team and our local community hosts. Um, I think the time was definitely right, uh, but uh, one of three key challenges, of course, was the fact that consumers always tend to go for the convenient option uh, in the end. No, There's still quite the gap between the change in our behavioral thinking and then the action we put to those words and thoughts. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. Um, and and uh, the Food Assembly is answering to that also by trying to make um, accessing these this kind of uh, alternative food systems more accessible uh, by a state-of-the-art uh, web platform, uh, weekly meetings, uh, also delivering, uh, uh, de developing uh, several uh, delivery options uh, and so on. So they're really uh, doing a great job at that and it was a very uh, amazing experience for me to be to be part of that. Yeah. Um, a second challenge that I think is, is very critical to uh, the development of short food supply chains in general is, is the economics of logistics. No, I guess that's what what wholesalers and the long supply chains uh, have been um, have been particularly good at. Uh, of course, also being it at at, at certain costs. Um, but uh, what I like about about the food assembly there again is that uh, we were building a decentralized food system, trying to decentralize uh, logistics, uh, the costs of it, but also the the added value uh, to and 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 bringing more of that uh, to the to the uh, the farmers, you know, the producers of of our food. Yeah. Um, and then uh, an, an other uh, interesting field of tension. Uh, that we really needed to work with also uh, relating to the organic movement I would say is to to um to stop looking at uh, at organic as something bina binary, you know, zero or one, yeah. bad or good, organic or not. Uh, I really came to believe that uh, it's more important to, to look at it as a, as a spectrum or a continuum from uh, degenerative uh, industrial large-scale agriculture to, to the more uh, regenerative uh, decentralized kind of uh, agroecological uh, food systems we, we want to move to. No? Yeah. Um, and no matter uh, what your position is on that continuum at this moment, what's most important, I would say, is your next step forward, you know, your next step to more sustainable and agroecological production and, and consumption methods. Yeah, uh, interesting last point there because um, um, Organic 3.0, as, as you know very well, is trying to bridge that gap you mentioned where, um, yeah, it, it's, it is a binary option. So currently it is, are you certified organic farmer or not? So... And Organic 3.0, we can see how um, different actors, when um, when they wrote that particular, you know, uh, strategy, is about how can we help that small farmer who has who is doing organic principles in their farming systems, but necessarily aren't able to access market. How can we enable them so that we don't 
um, see like there's a fence where they need to climb fast in order to join the organic community. So looking at it as a spectrum is a very good idea as well to try and bring in different people uh, into the system as well. But as long as they are very much enshrined with organic principles so that, you know, we can help them to grow and, you know, hold their hands as they continue in this particular journey. So I think that's a very, very important point to notice we continue to apply and uh, implement the 3.0 strategy moving forward. Yeah, yeah uh, I think we, we definitely also need to be aware of, of greenwashing efforts yeah. in, in the industry and and, and maybe uh, definitions being uh, deliberately kept vague and so on. But but I I, yeah, I love the Organic 3.0 vision and I think uh, they, they did a great work in, in, in formulating the way forward for, for organic and the agroecology and regenerative agriculture movement as a, as a whole. Yeah. Because I think in, in the principles and, and end goals, they are very much alike. Yeah. Uh, talking about the next step, I mean, right now you are very much entrenched um, in East Africa now, and especially in Uganda, where you are currently uh, mentoring about eight uh, young agroecological entrepreneurs. Um, so I would like to get your perspective on how has your experience been, I mean, interacting these entrepreneurs, and you can sort of give us also an overview. How are you seeing this particular environment, especially for entrepreneurs? And I mean, you're very much also involved here in Europe uh, in an entrepreneurial journey. So can you sort of help us, give us a context on how has been your experience, especially in an entrepreneurial environment there in Uganda? And then when you look up here in Europe, do you see any differences? And if yes, what are some of those differences you're seeing? Yeah, let me start by by first saying that uh, that what they all have in common, uh, all social entrepreneurs, is that they're very passionate. You no, know, especially in in agroecology. So that's that's a, a great starting point, uh, I would say. Uh, I do see uh, clearly some some differences in in levels of exposure. Um, to innovation, to out of the box thinking, uh, to food systems thinking itself. So I, that's also one of the elements I would uh, like to develop as a part of the of the Regeneration Fellowship uh, uh, startup studio uh, approach. Um, somebody told me here, uh, everyone is doing what their neighbor is doing, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 I guess uh, that makes it hard, you know, to differentiate yourself in 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 your community and, and local market and economy. So so I, I guess sometimes I would be looking for more innovative. IDs, uh, even though they're they're definitely there, and and also there's nothing wrong in, in replicating and, and adapting to your local context uh, a, a solution that is successful every, uh, elsewhere, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, one key difference, and then and then of course uh, I do think that the, the institutional uh, environment in, in in Europe, for instance, is is more favorable. Uh, access to capital and technical support uh, is also there. At the same time, yeah, there, there's more regulation, so maybe um, uh, a little less space for, for creative development uh, uh, of, of social enterprises. Um, but, but yeah, here, uh, it, it keeps on coming back. You no know, access to finance and technical support is really a key challenge in, in social entrepreneurship here here in Uganda and, and East Africa. I'm yeah. currently working with Biovision on the on the development of an East African agroecology accelerator, which uh, should be launched uh, as of next year, yeah. um, to support existing agroecological businesses to shift gears in, and, and grow their impact uh, by providing uh, support and uh, uh, access to finance. And, and yeah, uh, with the regeneration ship, that's also essentially what, uh, what I want to be doing. Amazing job. I mean, um, the fact that you are very much ready and uh, involved in terms of trying to help um, a different young entrepreneurs. And uh, I think we can all agree, well, starting an entrepreneur's journey is always... Um, yeah, very difficult uh, process. So at least having someone who has been through that journey and giving you guidance makes things a little bit easier uh, and also makes you a little bit calm, which allows you to be innovative and think outside the box. And yeah, for me, this, these are kind of the initi initiatives that, you know, we need more in terms of trying to understand their context and, you know, help them to innovate and uh, come up with very new and uh, different ideas. So I'm also very yeah. excited and see how, yeah, those dif different entrepreneurs uh, move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's definitely a lot of open questions, right? Uh, well, is, this is the startup studio something uh, that will work uh, in, in, 
East Africa. Uh, there's Fresh Venture Studios, who is actually, they, they, they came up with uh, very similar ideas to what I want to develop, and they, they are 18 uh, months uh, ahead of me. Uh, yeah. they're, they're going to start this uh, uh, approach in, in Europe uh, uh, next month, in November. They're starting their first cohort of entrepreneurs and, and future founders. But yeah, how is that going to work here in Uganda? and, and and other East African countries, uh, um, yeah. What, what what is the steward ownership? Uh, what kind of fit is that to to the way uh, African founders look at at starting businesses and, and owning them? Uh, yeah, there's still a lot of questions to to be answered in the future. That's why I, I desperately need to to pilot uh, as soon as possible. You have now been, uh, you know, you've you're now involved in yourself in um, uh, starting an uh, agroecological CSA farm. Um, so I'm just wondering also what has been your experience about starting it? I mean, how has been how do different farmers responded to it? How what was what was their first, you know, reaction when you shared with them this particular idea of starting a CSA farm? Was it something that they have had before? Um was this a new concept? Uh did they think that it can actually work? So help us uh, get into their minds and try to give us that perspective. What was their reactions when you're sharing them to this part, particular uh, CSA farm? Yeah, so every CSA farm um, usually works with <clears throat> one or only a couple of, of farmers, right? And and uh, in January, I was talking to some uh, young university graduates, uh, agronomists, uh, Fred and patients, and I, I dropped the idea of, of uh, Starting a CSA basically because I was looking at at uh, healthy uh, vegetables uh, yeah. also uh, for for my, my own consumption uh, because the things I can find here in the market uh, are quite uh, uh, doubtful in terms of uh, um, yeah quality and 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 production methods let's say um, so uh, and only uh, ten days after they 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 sent me a, a business plan and then we started working on that business plan fine tuning it looking for our first members and and in June we started uh, our first uh, field activity. Activities. Um, I actually, they did. I'm, I'm just trying to, to support them in, in, in the setup and management of, of this project. Um, tomorrow, we actually have our first, uh, oh no, sorry, our, our third member meeting, but it's quite a critical moment in time yeah. because we, we, we need to renew the, the membership fees for the next harvest season. And, and it's definitely a, a challenging uh, um, endeavor, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's great to move forward. And, and what we're actually doing, and that's really important, is that we're reshaping uh, the relationships uh, around food production and consumption. No, usually it's the it's the resource poor farmer that is carrying all the burden and risks that are associated with costs of production, uh, bad harvests, pest infection, and so on, uh, infestation, and so on. And and now we're moving all uh, or most of that risk uh, to the to the consumers, to the community. Um, so that the concept is basically to to prepay your harvest share. Uh, we now pay it uh, first time for for half a half a year uh, of production on our farm. Yeah. Um, still running until end of November, uh, that first harvest season. And and by doing so, we all also share the the risks of, of having a bad harvest, but also the, har the the fruits of that harvest, right? So, if if um, if okra or or uh, or the beans worked out really well, we'll have more of those in our weekly basket. Yeah. If tomatoes were a complete failure because of yeah difficulties with with our with our soil that needs to be uh, regenerated or or pest infestation and so on, then we'll have no or, or or very little tomatoes in our basket, and that's that's part of of agriculture, right? And yeah. and so we're trying to to bring that reality also closer to the consumers again uh, the, the the thing that i like about this particular concept is that it it's helping farmers to sort of decentralize that particular risk because um, in normal circumstances if for example you mentioned beans don't do well well the farmer just slides with it i mean text absorbs all the risks but in this particular time i mean when you're involved in this csa that risk is spread across all members sort of decentralized in a way which is um which i can imagine could help um, keep a lot of farmers afloat as well so um interesting concepts and um it's great great to see that it's actually working on um uh, yeah different contexts and also working on in a very uh yeah remote part of africa which is very, very much exciting. Um, how easy it can also be replicated to different parts of uh, Africa as well. Yeah, definitely. For me, it's a, it's a very hands-on uh, and, and grateful experience to to be involved with those uh, uh, young people, fret and patients. Also, actually uh, facing that difficulty, you know, of of, of finding a job, yeah. uh, and and now really uh, being involved in this very beautiful uh, community project.
So uh, I also would like to get your perspective on this particular point. I mean, you are very well vast on uh, different parts of the world. You've worked, you've very much entrenched yourself in Europe, in Latin America, and now in Africa. So, you know, from a sustainable food system point of view, can you compare these particular three regions? I mean, are they even comparable at all in terms of their food systems? And if yes, what do you see uh, the major differences? Because, um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is Africa, small-scale farmers, Latin America, probably small-scale farmers. Um, Europe is very much industrialized. From your experience, what can you tell us on um, yeah these three different food systems and how they compare with each other? Yeah, that's a, a fantastic, but also a very ambitious question no, for me to to answer. Um, yeah. I think there are definitely different levels of um, yeah economic development, uh, political regimes. Poverty, uh, for sure, uh, and also infrastructure, for instance, to, to bring your goods to the market yeah. um, that, that, that we should consider. But I also see a lot of um, uh, commonalities, no? for instance, access to land, access to finance, access to markets, uh, access to quality inputs. They're challenging uh, basically uh, anywhere. Um, so that's um, food waste is another example that we, that great food losses after harvest uh, uh, is another challenge that that it's I guess common to to our global food system. Yeah. Um, Something that really surprised me here in Africa um, is the way the Green Revolution has has polluted mindsets, mm -hmm. the, the mindsets of uh, extension workers, the mindsets of um, policymakers, uh, development professionals, and so on. And and um, that's really um, yeah alarming to me. Uh, I'd say. Uh, uh, even though it, it's it's very popular no, in, in public policy, let's say, yeah. to, to work on green revolution kind of solutions, even though the use of chemicals is actually still quite low. Here in Uganda, only 23% of uh, farming households uh, applies uh, chemical inputs. No? Yeah. Uh, another interesting figure is that uh, the, the false promises study uh, found out that uh, uh, over the last decade, um, costs of inputs uh, have risen 20%, while the actual yields related to those chemical inputs only uh, improved by by five percent. No, so there's definitely something wrong in the in the in the logic there. Yeah. That's a great uh, uh, or, or, or an unfortunate point, uh, I think, um, uh, here in in East, in East Africa. Yeah. Um, second big challenge to me, uh, uh, and it's been debated largely uh, now with the UN Food Systems Summit, is that. Uh, our ambition to move forward with a sus truly sustainable food system and 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 the agroecological approach uh, is, is positioned no as the best way forward uh, to do so uh, it's actually a political decision it's not a technical issue it's not an economical challenge it's 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 mostly uh, political in in my opinion so um that building that political vision and and also uh, having that urgently translate into action that's a a, a very um, big challenge uh, we're, we're currently facing yeah. um and a final element uh, is, is is yeah corporate capture is is real no we, we've seen it now at, at the food Food system summit itself, um, and and in, in in most of our food systems, uh, unfortunately, we we can observe unfair trading practices uh, and oligopolies. No, in in yeah. in meat, in beers, in grains, uh, in tea, uh, in all of those products on the world uh, level, there's four companies, only four companies controlling more than 80% of the world markets. I would also say that there, there is no free market in food, right? Yeah. The only thing we see, or, or what we mostly see, I would say, uh, is is fair, is unfair trade instead of instead of free trade. Uh, and so, even liberal economists um, uh, would uh, um, yeah turn around in their grave. You know, at the core of it is how you know how bad do our leaders want it? How bad do consumers want it? Because at the end, we are the people who have to make decisions. So. Um, it doesn't matter if you are in Africa, Europe, or in Latin America. It's it's about how do you want, especially now from a consumer perspective, are you able to demand sustainable foods um, in from your supermarket or from your um, supply or from your local grocery? It you know they they are at different levels, but as 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 a consumer myself, you have to start by you know what are what are the basic decisions that i can make in order to make this food system accelerate and you can decide by you know what you're buying for example is it you know sustainable yeah. is it um yeah something that i will be proud of um 
as I continue to look forward for to more uh, food, uh, sustainable food systems, and especially buying from sustainable f- uh, farmers, for example, it helps send a message to them that yes, your sustainable food systems. I mean, I want your product, so you can continue producing more. And you know, to some extent, as as consumers, we have a huge role to play. As you know, different um, entities, governments, uh, non um, non government organizations continue to work uh, to push it towards this uh, particular end as well. Yeah, I, I want to react to that, and, and I think we should be careful about that too. I mean, we, we've discussed the issue of, of, or the difficulty of behavioral change and, yeah. and, and consumers going for the more convenient option. So uh, it's also really important to look at the options they have uh, at hand. No? Yeah. Of course, we should eat less meat, we should fly less, we should turn off the lights when we leave the room and so on. But but it, uh, this is a systemic problem, and, and, and uh, that's why, why I want to insist on, on the political part of, of this debate and, and, and about, yeah, finally, making decisions, uh, uh, start taxing carbon uh, emissions, for instance, yeah. um, uh, start, start looking at uh, food safety and food uh, or nutrient density of food um, and, and making that information available um, to consumers and, and, and yeah, just yeah, really take into account which options a uh, consumer uh, are having and, yeah. and are also presented with and which options companies can also develop to present to those consumers. So I think it's really a, yeah, more of a systemic uh, discussion and, and yeah, policy has is, is an important role to play and, and is lagging behind. Yeah. Um, but luckily, luckily also there is a, a great momentum of, of agroecology you know, being increasingly recognized by mm-hmm. multilateral institutions, uh, uh, backed by science. There is a, a, a gigantic amount of, of, of scientific evidence on, on the, the role of, of agroecology in transforming our food system. Um, there are huge farmer movements and, and, and the agroecological regenerative uh, and organic movements uh, are growing and, and their momentum uh, is now. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the United uh, the United Nations is talking about sustainable food systems. I mean, every major uh, organization from an international stage is talking a move towards um, um, sustainable food system. Here in Europe, in the European Union, they have um, a very ambitious farm to fork strategy as well, which is sustainable food systems as the center of this transition. So we can see definitely there is a shift um, in mindset and also in actions towards sustainable food systems. And that leads me to my next question here now is the fact that, you know, you've spent, um, you know, largely majority of your, you know, your career in this particular system. I mean, I'm talking about sustainable food systems. uh, I'm talking about short food supply chains. What can you say has been your major takeaway from uh, your involvement in these systems? I mean, are we moving towards um, sustainable food systems and what do you think needs to be done in order to accelerate this transition? Yeah, what's great about the the SDGs for 2030 is 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 this this idea of we only have nine harvests left. No, so uh, the, there is definitely a, a great sense of, of urgency that I also wanna uh, wanna transmit and also always try to to insist on. Um, uh, what um, did I did I come to appreciate? As key takeaways, yeah, I would say all, all of the above, uh, probably. Um, and an interesting question I came across uh, lately uh, was: um, Do we need, do we want more or less farmers? Um, it's a it's a powerful question uh, indeed. But maybe uh, I would rephrase the question: Do we want more farmers uh, and people in general to escape to be able to overcome poverty uh, or, or not? No. And if we want so, um, then uh, recognizing no that that we're looking at countries where six. 60 to 80 percent of the population depends on subsistence agriculture, um, uh, then I think we, we need to rebuild our food systems, uh, distributing power and economic relationships um, and, and working towards uh, flourishing agroecological communities uh, with diversified farms, uh, local uh, food supply chain networks, uh, regenerating soil health, uh, yeah. water management uh, and so on. And, and we know how to do all of that. So it's really, again, a political decision and support uh, that needs to be put behind uh, or to those words, um, and and yeah, we have agroecology. We we can work on, on permaculture uh, at landscape levels, which would be a very uh, exciting project. I would also love to 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 work on and, and 
and regenerative agriculture is, is booming. So we, we know uh, where to go and, and just needs to, to start taking those uh, next steps. And, and if, I mean, looking at nature uh, is beautiful, no? Uh, agroecological systems are, are, are beautiful and, um, and, and it's just, uh, we need to find ways of optimizing our food outputs in, in, in those systems. And I say optimizing, not, not maximizing, uh, to be clear, no? Um, so, yeah, we, we can regenerate soils. We, we can even bring back rains yeah. uh, with, with this kind of uh, agroecological uh, approach and, and revive communities, no? So, um, talk to any smallholder farmer, any agroecological entrepreneur, and you, you'll, you'll feel that same passion. And that's, that's really uh, keeping me very hopeful. I must say from this conversation, I also feel very um, hopeful in terms of uh, what direction we are going to take moving forward. I'm very empowered now as a consumer, very empowered from a macro perspective as well, uh, in terms of what um, international different international organizations are doing. I'm also very inspired from your personal experiences as well, uh, in terms of what you've been doing across the world, basically, uh, from Latin America, from Europe into Africa now, some of the amazing projects that you're involved. For me, I'm super, super inspired, and I'm sure um, a lot of people will be able to listen to these conversations will be um, super inspired as well. Maybe your last thoughts as, um, um, yeah, as we conclude this conversation? Well, yeah, also just want to thank you. I, I also think that the work you're doing with this, with this podcast and, 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 and colleagues of yours doing uh, similar uh, kind of podcasts uh, uh, are mutually inspiring uh, me and a lot of other people. So I think that's also a very, very um, um, important work uh, you're doing. Uh, and yeah, I just want to express, I guess, my, my, my drive to, to keep on working uh, uh, as part of the organic movement uh, here in Uganda and East Africa and, and all across the world, uh, uh, hopefully um, developing this Regeneration Fellowship uh, startup studio yeah. approach in the coming years and, and, and hopefully being able to, to spread that uh, uh, to, to different countries, no? uh, enabling local entrepreneurs, people like you to, to start their businesses and, 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 and find co-founders and, and, and really uh, develop the best solutions for the, for the local context based on, on agroecological principles. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your compliments as well. Um, yeah, it it's um, yeah, it always feels good when you see a lot of people appreciating your work as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like us to go into our fun part of the interview. Although you know, there's a lot of um, information that we have already discussed about. This is a rapid fire question. Um, so where I just throw to you a question and you, yeah, you give me your answers. And so, are you ready to? get started yeah let's go okay first question what is the first career that you dreamed of of having as a kid obviously before becoming aware about uh, co2 emissions uh, um, i wanted to be a flight pilot um second question if you had to eat uh, one thing for every meal going forward what would that be I always say it's it's pizza, uh, or, or hopefully, I, if I can choose a category, it would be the Italian cuisine. No, I really love the freshness and the quality of their of their ingredients, and 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 yeah, enjoyed uh, uh, very much going to Terra Madre and and just seeing all those uh, the, all that richness, no, in, in, in natural uh, agrobiodiversity. Hmm, good taste right there. Um, number three, who is your favorite historical figure? Uh, so uh, I'll mention uh, Pepe Mujica. He's a, a philosopher. He's also a, a, a for, former uh, rebel. Uh, so probably not innocent uh, in that sense. Um, and, and he's also an ex-president uh, of Uruguay. Hmm. Um, and and I, I appreciate him because every interview with him uh, is a treat from a philosophical uh, point of view and uh, and he has shown the world that uh, being a politician politician is actually being in service of your people fourth question what sport do you like to watch or participate in uh, uh, surfing surfing waves uh, I started doing that in Peru and I'll, I'll never let go of it again nice um, hopefully do you find some places <laughs> do surfing in Uganda, in Uganda it's quite. a landlocked country so that's challenging <laughs> Yeah, nice. Okay. Um, fifth question. If you could have any animal in the world as a pet, what would it be and why? Um, I'm not sure about pets, but, but I definitely would love to be an eagle one day, for one day. An eagle. Okay, good. Um, what is your favorite beverage, coffee or tea? Tea. Yeah, I, I, don't take, uh, I don't drink coffee. Question number seven. What is your favorite book? 
Um, yeah, there, there's many, but at the moment I'm reading uh, Hungry City from Caroline Steele, which really is a, a nice expose about how uh, our relation with food actually shaped our cities. Um, really insightful. Um, the next question is, I mean, we are a few months away from Christmas, but um, I'd like to take you, have your take on this. How old yes. were you when you realized Santa isn't real? Um Actually, I'm, I'm not sure about Santa. Uh, it was quite early, but in, in Belgium, we, we have also uh, St. Nicholas who brings us gifts on the 6th of December. Yeah. And uh, I tried, when I found out uh, it wasn't real, I tried to hide that from my parents uh, as long as possible. <laughs> what quote resonates with you most? Uh, I'll take uh, Je mange donc je suis, which is a, a version or variation of, of Descartes, no? uh, I eat so I am. Uh, yeah. I think it's a great quote quotes uh, in describing um, how yeah how our what we eat uh, shapes us and how our relationship to food also uh, uh, is intrinsically uh, tied to to our relationship with the world around us um, and lastly knowing what you know right now um, what advice would you give to your 18 year old self and uh, this one is difficult eh? I, I I feel very privileged in life. I come for a, from a very privileged background, so I, I'll, I'll probably I would tell myself to uh, manage uh, that privilege responsibly, and and yeah, to to enjoy while while I'm at it. Nice, um, yeah, definitely loved uh, that particular session. I mean, yeah, it sort of um, helped uh, the viewers to get to know you a little bit better. So. Thank you very much for participating in and um, yeah, got to learn a few things about you as well. So thank you very much for joining me in the podcast. It's been a very much uh, pleasure to have you on. Great insights, great information as well. A lot of viewers will find this very, very informational. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great questions. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this uh, too. Thanks a lot. Nice. Cheers.